Okay, year 12. So, mouse. I strongly recommend that you watch this screencast and also that you print these slides out, pin them up on your wall if you need to remember key points in the text. <coughs> All right, the first, um, I'm going to call these paragraph ideas because that's essentially what they are. They're things that by the time exams roll around, you need to have a paragraph written on. So the first one is the father-son relationship. So the father-son relationship is very much at the center of this text. This is a book about a son, Artie, trying to understand his father, Vladek, and his father's Holocaust experiences. So it's only through um, creating or writing this book, the graphic novel, The Complete Mouse, that Artie and his father begin to form a relationship. But in this book, we see that the relationship that they have is fractured. It's fractured because they can't understand each other. Artie can't understand what Vladek went through, and Vladek can't understand Artie because he compares everything to the Holocaust. And of course, Anya, who is Artie's mother, is not there to um, soften the blow. Of course, we don't get Anya's perspective because uh, Vladek burnt her diaries, okay? Um, the father-son relationship is also in many ways fractured because Art feels guilty about his life when he compares it to Vladek. He feels guilty about having had um, an easier life than what his father did. And as a result of his guilt and as a result of Vladek's own, I guess, uh, tendency to compare things to the Holocaust, he feels like he lives in his father's shadow. So I've got two examples to show you. So the first one is here from the very first pages from the epigraph and uh, Artie's fallen over roller skating and he comes back home and uh, complains that his friends left him and Vladek of course compares Artie falling over to the Holocaust. He says, friends, your friends, if you lock them together in a room with no food for a week, then you could see what it is, friends. So Artie gets the message that his pains are insignificant in comparison to what Vladek went through in the Holocaust. Um, okay, this one. No matter what I accomplish, it doesn't seem like much compared to surviving Auschwitz. And then his psychologist, Pavel, says, but you weren't in Auschwitz, you were in Rijo Park. So the psychiatrist tries to tell him, why do you always compare yourself to Auschwitz? But I think he can't help it because, you know, he lost his mother as a result, potentially, of the Holocaust. And his father's a very um, cantankerous or, you know, a man who's hard to get along with. And he just feels guilty about this. So, again, this troubled father-son relationship. Let's talk about the past and present. All right. So how do we know when the narrative levels switch? Well, the bike, the exercise, the chair going for walks with Artie, they all symbolise transitional times in the text, all right? And they um, allow us a visual symbol of when the meta-narrative layers switch. And we know that generally the bike, the chair, the walks are all part of the frame narrative, okay? Um, so in terms of visually distinguishing between past and present, we know that borders are really important because we know that we see borderless panels at the start and the end of every chapter um, so that as readers we can easily be aware of the changes and it's really interesting when you read this book for the first time You're not actually thinking oh look the panel doesn't have any borders Therefore, you know we've moved back into the present your brain just knows this. Okay, you are able to subconsciously read these visual cues um, and the past and present especially with the um, graphic novel format we can see the continued impact that the past has because it intrudes upon the present and it affects the lives of Artie and Vladek. And I'm sorry I haven't put page numbers on here, but we did talk about page numbers in class. Um, so the example with Lucia, I can tell you other stories, but such private things I don't want you should mention. Uh, the difference in Vladek from past to present, well, that's enough today. I must, I'm tired, I must still count my pills. So the fact that the 
the noble young hero that he was during the Holocaust is markedly different to the um, fragile older man. And of course, we can see um, the borders, the temporal borders of time and space being interrupted, often by Adi. Uh, here's your example for um, the end of the story about Lucia Greenberg. All right. So we can see that this is a transitional panel because we've got the uh, no frame. And we've got the characters shrouded in black as well. Here we can see the contrast between the Vordek that we've heard about in the historical narrative and the Vordek in the frame narrative who gets tired and must, you know, count his pills, he's neurotic. And then here we see the visual bridging between past and present. So our Artie is able to physically bridge the divide between past and present as he tries to recreate his father's story. And then finally here we can see the present kind of overlaying the past. So uh, we've got the camp tattoo being placed on the deck. I, I was a lucky one, everything fitted me and the shirt was torn a bit big for me. All right, and then they registered us in, they took us from us our names and here they put our number. And of course you can see that the number still remains on his arm. As a, and you can see that he's been drawn as sort of over um, arcing the historic narrative. Let's talk about the process of creation, otherwise known as the meta narrative. So um, we can call this super present, this third narrative level. And Spiegelman conveys his own struggle or art struggle to understand his parents' trauma. So uh, Artie struggles to understand what his parents went through and he thinks about this uh, in the meta narrative. Um, in the meta narrative, Art also wonders about his attempts to recreate the past and make sense of his father's relationship and the Holocaust legacy. And he, he wonders whether he's good enough. So it's, um, it's very, the phrase that we'd use is it's very meta, of course, because it's a book about the creation of a book about the creation of a book. So it gets really confusing. Try and wrap your head around that one. Uh, throughout the meta narrative, readers see Art worrying about recreating the emotional and visual cues. So Art's really worried about presenting this like unbiased uh, view of the Holocaust. That's one of his primary concerns is everything has to be accurate or real. All right. Um, and then similarly, um, the through the process of creation, through this meta narrative, where Artie can break the fourth wall and address the reader. The reader learns about how Artie has a deep sense of inadequacy because he can't comprehend his parents' experiences. All right. Um, the first example I want to talk about is the discussions he has with his wife, uh, Francois. Actually, all three of these quotes are from that part of the book, so page 176. Um, so he says to her, don't get me wrong, I wasn't obsessed with this stuff. It's just that sometimes I fantasize Zach won't be coming out of our shower instead of water. So if we go back and we look at the fact that it's Art's struggle to understand, it's him thinking about how and what his parents went through. So again, he really battles, he tries to put himself in their position, but he can't. And here he says it really well. He says, I feel so inadequate trying to reconstruct a reality that was worse than my darkest dreams. So he worries about doing justice to not only his parents' Holocaust story, I think, but to the Holocaust story of millions of other Jews. All right, the positives of the graphic novel format. Well, we know that through the graphic novel format, we can see the past and present being easily interchangeable, which is always a good thing. What would normally take pages and pages can be done just like that sort of thing, really quickly, really efficiently. Um, it also means that the past and present can exist simultaneously with each other, all right, which is really interesting. But, um, you know, quite often the, uh, the brain narrative will just kind of sit on top of the historic narrative or side by side. Um, we can see the impact of the past upon the present, not only in terms of relationships, but it's drawn quite visually. So it might be like the visual depiction of the death that we'll talk about on page 14. Um, 
And I think to what's in this text, like the cat and mouse metaphor, you couldn't do in a regular text. It'd be really hard. I think it just adds this whole other dimension to it that couldn't have been done in a normal book. Um, both examples I've got are from page 14. So this one we can talk about like the past and present in terms of the juxtaposition of like the deck in the past who was totally just looked like the famous uh, Rudolf Valentino who I think was an American music star and the image of him hunched over on his exercise was contrasted with like the poster behind and also maybe note and I'm just picking up on this the imagery in that poster behind it's kind of circular and they're dancing and it's kind of like later on we see those images of Anya and Vladef dancing and of course also that circular motif of the swastika so I reckon that's probably all pretty relevant the other example was this one where the wheels of Vladek's exocycle, so see the wheel here, has a thicker border and it um, intrudes upon the historic, no, the frame narrative, sorry. So the past is pushing into the present here when it says I was in textiles buying and selling. The past intrudes physically through the visuals onto the present. Oh, this one, I love this example. The fact that we've got the past and present existing simultaneously through this little insert. And it's almost like he's looking down at his family. So this this here is the frame narrative and this is the historic narrative. And it's with Deck um, looking in at his family because, of course, it's really interesting to see that these are the windows, of course. And I just think when you think about it like this, the fact that he's drawn it is like, the windows and looking in and then the decks from above it's just so clever what about the limitations all right and of course you can always spin the limitations to be a positive but it's worth just kind of thinking about and talking about well you could say that because it's so condensed there's not a lot of room for discussion all right so there's not a lot that you can kind of add to this it's very short sharp and sweet sort of thing so room for only preeminent information to be incorporated. Um, the text also likes detail from a Holocaust perspective, um, like because it's just um, sort of what Vladek remembers, but then we can talk about memory later on and say that's a good thing. So this is all like a double-edged sword, double entendre. Um, restrictive because it's condensed, limited to the memory of one, and there's a lack of alternate voices of oops and that should have said history so it's just one voice that we hear just for dex voice and we don't know how accurate it is um and of course art's goal to understand his parents holocaust experience is limited by the fact that he has access to only one parent's testimony it's not even like his mother and his father all right so um the frame is of course compromised you know, tell me more about 1943. And also the fact that quite often um, what we know from Vladek's perspective might not be accurate, such as the orchestra. And so here when Artie interjects into the text to try and get Vladek back onto track, so the fact that it's like symbolic of like memory, but that could be a limitation that it is just Vladek's memory and it's not overly linear or clear sometimes. I like this page too. I think you guys can really use this in an essay, this whole idea of the orchestra. I just read about the camp orchestra that plays with much through the gate, but Vladek can't remember this, so instead Artie draws the orchestra, but he draws them kind of being covered. But of course, it's not a historically accurate book is the limitation. I don't really know why I put that there. I think I was supposed to put it earlier and I got confused. Anyway. Memory. Um, we're going to talk about this on seminar day, I reckon. Might even write an essay on it in the near future. Um, and you've been given an essay to read about this whole idea of memory. Um, the graphic novel form represents the nature of memory. So Spiegelman is actually trying to remind readers constantly that this book is the memories that his father has of Auschwitz. Uh, the memories that he has of interviewing his father as well. So two of the narrative levels are primarily concerned with memories. Um, so how do we draw or how do we represent memories? Well, the first time 
um, the first sighting of the gates of Auschwitz. Like it's like half a page and it bleeds out. So it's significant in the memory. So therefore, like it's drawn bigger. Um, so we need to get familiar with the word like oral testimony or oral narrative. That's what it is. Like meaning that it's a story that is told and it's the story that's told from father to son. But of course, um, oral testimony is relying on memory. And so Spiegelman tries to show that. He tries to like visualize that. Um, we talked about the fact it's the memory not only of Lord Deck in the Holocaust, but the memory Spiegelman has of interviewing his father. Now the panels are really interesting in terms of representing memory. So in the frame narrative, when art interviews for deck, things are quite calm and structured. So the panels tend to be all the same size. And this is another way that we tend to visually see the difference between the different narrative levels. Because then when we get to the historic narrative, the panels are more disrupted, all right? Because they're not so clear and logical, right here? Let's talk about three examples. The half page bleed when they came to Auschwitz for the first time. Just look at the level of detail. You've got the gate, you've got the swastika, the buildings. There's something going on. Oh, this must be the smoke, of course, from the chimney, the smoke from the crematoriums. We can't really see the faces of the Nazis, which is interesting. Also interesting that there's a dog here, of course, to remind us that these are people wearing masks. And we can see that, of course, I mean, look at their like the way they're drawn that's clearly like a human's body and it's just the mask of an animal right so that's why we use the word anthropomorphic um if you want to know more about prisoner on health planet please go back and watch the earlier screencasts it's really important that you take a lot of time to just slowly read through prisoner on health planet and try and understand what's going on but the little scene i've selected here is um the last time that Artie sees his mother. And of course, remember that Prisoner and Hell Planet is when they're drawn as humans and it's a much more sort of traditional comic form, but there's also still a lot in it and you can see too just how dark it is. So Artie says, she came into my room. It was late at night and she says, Artie, you still love me, don't you? And his response is, sure, ma. And he says, I turned away, resentful of the way she tied the umbilical cord. So this is like a, these are two really big panels within Prisoner and Hell Planet. Um, and I'd say like the drawing and the color scheme and the size all show how they're like a um, very prevalent memory for him, of course, the last time he saw his mother. Um, this is really interesting too. Um, this is when Vladek talks about like, how he, three people were hung, one of them the friend of his father-in-law and how they hang there. Um, and he says they hung, they hang there one full week so he has to walk past them each day and this memory really stands out. And it's interesting to see that here we're not seeing their faces so much but we're definitely seeing their Jewish stars on them and then you can see all the people slowly filing past here. The Nazi is of course Faceless again. All right. Radio. This text is fragmented, and what I mean by that is that it tends to be a little bit disrupted, okay? It's not smooth, it's non linear, all right? It's a non linear text. So we can say that this is okay though, because it reflects memory, it reflects the internal process of thoughts all right and that adds substance of course we don't think in a linear so in a straight fashion we're a bit all over the place so of course the next memories and Artie's um conversations with him are at times going to be non-linear so we see one example of the disruptions or the fragmented nature of the text is um when art clarifies something and the time shifts again um because art wants to remind us about the nature of this book and how it was created, okay? Um, but this is good. It, it completes the story in a way that it wouldn't have if it was a historical recount because we need to see, like, the odd little conversations with Ledeck and, you know, the little bit at the front about Lucia. And then one of the other things, I guess, that makes it fragmented is you can argue that Prisoner on Hell Planet fragments it because it's like a separate insert. And on seminar day, we'll talk about the role of the photos 
in terms of being like a bit of a like stark like departure from the text to sort of serve as a reminder to the nature of the text. Um, this one's from the end of that chapter where he talks about Lucia. It has nothing to do with Hitler, with the Holocaust. He doesn't want his personal stories included. Art goes one step further. Not only does he include the stories, he includes the conversation with Vladek to make it more interesting. Um, I really like the quote down here. In some ways, he's just like the racist character of the miserly old Jew. And Marla says, huh, you can say that again because Marla and Artie have been talking about Fladek and everything in the book. And, um, you know, Marla's like, oh, well, you know, he's not perfect. Don't draw him as perfect. Let's talk about the animal metaphor to finish off with, okay? So remember, they are not um, animals. They are humans wearing animal masks. They are anthropomorphic. So Spiegelman doesn't do anything new. He takes an idea that already exists that the Nazis um, had even before their time and that they just took to a new level. So he comes up with this idea that um, the Jews are vermin, so they're the rats and mice, so draw them as the mice, the cat and mouse metaphor. So I've said Spiegelman not only creates a binary opposition of organisation and disorder, um, but displays the Jews as mice and Nazis as cats as a further continuation of the relationships that need each other to be significant. Cat means nothing without mouse in this context, same thing. Mouse, Jew means nothing without cat, Nazi. They need each other to be significant, which is why we call it a binary opposition. All right. It's kind of ironic that he chooses a cat and mouse, and he says that himself, but it's a link back to this traditional rivalry. And, of course, um, the, the Nazis really couldn't see the Jews as humans, so he just takes this to its natural limit. Um, and, of course, we see them, we see their human struggles so much. We don't think, oh, there's a mouse visiting his psychiatrist. We think, oh, there's a human visiting his psychiatrist. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so the quote at the start of the text from Adolf Hitler the Jews are undoubtedly a race, but they are not human. So it reminds the audience that Spiegelman's decision to draw Jews as mice was playing on the dehumanising way that the Nazis saw the Jews. Um, in Time Flies, I was depicted wearing a mouse mask that faces struggles that are very much human when he visits Pavel. And he says, Pavel says, how can I explain? Boo! Um... And we don't judge the individuals involved, and I couldn't find that example um, on my PDF versions, but I was thinking about the whole idea of the character of Tosha. We're not, we don't see her harshly. We don't judge Tosha for what she did. The Jews are undoubtedly a race, but they're not human. Hitler, what Auschwitz felt like? Hmm, how can I explain? Boo. That is that.